we are live. Welcome to this week's Tuesday Night Live. I have a special guest with me. We've got Chris here from uh, Blink Property New South Wales. Chris, thanks for hey, coming on board. Give you a high five. Yeah, thanks for spending your Tuesday night here. <laughs> <laughs> um, just wait until a few people join up on live. Sometimes I get very shadow Dan Chris because I say very controversial things. Uh, <laughs> I'm scared that I'm going to scare Chris off. He'll be like, fuck, who's this, who's this bloke that I work with here? It's, uh, yeah. But uh, we'll just wait for a few people to hop online and we will get straight into tonight's um, tonight's broadcast. So got lots of news articles to talk about. I've got a couple of videos for us to watch together. Um, I've got Chris here. For those of you that don't know who Chris is, Chris is a senior property manager here at Blink Property in New South Wales. Uh, managing, uh, overseeing the whole uh, New South Wales um, property management business. And yep. I've been up to something quite interesting. I've been on back-to-back -back phone calls with my investors for the last uh, two weeks, three weeks. And I've been on about eight hours worth of calls a day. So it's been giving me very little time to hop onto emails and stuff like that. I'm always I'm about a week behind emails. Um, but something I found very interesting, and that's reviewing our investors' property portfolios and realizing how we can grow um, the, the their portfolios during this time and uh, increase their revenues and all that sort of stuff. And um, property management, the rental market is going nuts, we're seeing a lot of, not in every area, but we're seeing a lot of rent increases and stuff happening out there. Um, some people aren't getting rent increases that, you know, we want to get rent increases and it's just mm -hmm. not their time yet. But um, I'm seeing a lot of our investors, like one of our investors have got 1100 bucks a week extra uh, rental income coming through. Uh, the guy lost his job, increased his uh, income by 1100 bucks a week by just putting up 50 bucks here, 100 bucks there, that sort of thing across the portfolio. Um, lots of investors that have been able to get back to servicing, so it might be a lot of people watching this and um, you know, they might be thinking, they'll be thinking, oh, I can't get a loan, I can't buy any property, can't have fun out there in the market at the moment. But you know, by tweaking their existing portfolio, doing some renovations, adding some value, improving their rents, uh, they're able to do so. So um, I'm gonna ask Chris a few questions just so you guys get to know Chris. Uh, a lot of you guys would be uh, using Blink Property New South Wales. If you're not, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice because if you've got a rental property, you've got the option of getting a normal real estate agent to manage it, or you've got myself and the team here to be able to manage the properties. Um, and I've been throwing out there a lot recently for you guys to even email me personally to look at the review of the portfolio. And then I go to Blink with Chris and the team and we work out strategies to maximize your rental uh, return and, and manage your revenue. If your real estate agent isn't understanding what your goals are, if your real estate agent isn't um, you know, taking an interest of how can we help you build that portfolio even more, they're doing you a disservice. So there is a big difference between having just a real estate agent managing a property. Everyone has a real estate managing their properties or 99% of people have a real estate agent looking after their properties. Why not let us? So uh, for those of you that know Chris or deal with Chris on a, a daily basis, I've got a few little questions here to get to know Chris. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most interesting or unusual hobby you've ever had and what drew you to it? Yeah, well, thanks, Nathan. I think Coming from a sports background, and especially in New Zealand, I didn't really have a lot of time for hobbies, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I had a... I was going to go up with a sheep joke, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all do. <laughs> um, had a basketball uh, incident where I couldn't play for several years, so I actually took up picture framing. Um, really? Okay. Which made it quite sedentary, but it was really enjoyable for the fact that you could create things um anything that you saw in print you could put it in a frame and it was great so yeah. that was yeah that's fine. i don't do it anymore now because i'm not <laughs> i'm not lying around on a bed anymore so okay there yeah. we go that's a, i would never have picked that mm. are you surprised you said you were a basketball coach for years or something you? Like you basketball player for a long long time player, yeah. national league in new zealand and now i coach and i'm uh, looking after the uh, Hornsby Karingai Spiders at the moment, under 13, under 14 girls. So, okay, cool. Yeah, thoroughly enjoying it. Cool, cool. And what's, if we were to look at, you know, your lifetime and you've come from New Zealand to Australia, um, you know, 
adventures around the world? Like, do you have a memorable yeah, adventure? I think, I think the biggest one that stands out for me is the Grand Canyon. Um, okay. I spent a week or so there, um, helicoptered in, did the things that the tourists generally do, and then made some tours to go through there as well, you know, on foot. So absolutely overwhelmed by the size of it, yeah. um, Hoover Dam, all that sort of thing. It's just, it's a real eye-opener compared to what we've seen yeah. in New Zealand and what yeah. we generally see here as well. So, yeah, that was special. But a random question for you about the this one, and you might be like, fuck, is Nathan really getting asked these questions, right? <laughs> so the, you've been to... Um, You've, you've been there um, to the Grand Canyon. Do you think there's anything inside the Grand Canyon, like, from seeing it? I think Some people think that it's been mined or it's an old mine, like some thousands of years ago, mining site and stuff like that. From what I saw, no. I'd right. say it's just purely erosion. It's yeah, okay. taken that through. Yeah, okay. um, the water still flows at an amazing speed, right. so yeah. I can understand why it would be yeah. over the years. But yeah. yeah, I don't think it was ever. It's too long. It's too big. Yeah. It's too grand. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I take uh, I take someone out to the uh, this, this old fellow out to um, the Blue Mountains. I go for drives out, check out the, the motel and the renovations on it, yeah. and um, I uh, this guy he questions everything. He goes. I believe that the Blue Mountains was a an old mine site, right? And I was like, interesting. I never would have thought that. And he goes, no, look at the walls there, right? And I was actually talking to someone as I was driving out to my farm. I've got a big farm out west. I went out there the other day. And I said, do you think that this could be mined? And they turned around and they're like, actually, when you look at the wall, like a lot of it actually looks like a mine. It's just interesting because who knows what it could have been done. Yeah, I guess the, minerals and yeah. the, the history books up there would probably put you right, wouldn't they? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So it's uh, yeah. always question those things. Mm. Uh, just like we should question our government. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you've been in property management for a long time now. I um, have. In, you've been internationally in property management. International property yeah. manager. Yeah. yeah. What would be um, one of the most challenging? management uh, issues that you've seen and, and how did you solve it? Um, murder. Murder, that was, okay. that was pretty high up there. Did you solve the murder? Or did you, <laughs> you tried, to, tried to, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Wondering why someone hadn't paid rent. Um, you go to do a welfare check and, yeah, you've, you come across telltale signs that of break and entry, so it's, it's all a matter of ring, ring the police. Yeah. And yeah, there was a, a body in there that had been um, sure. put to its end. Wow. So yeah, we, of course, are not allowed to get in there and <laughs> touch the evidence. And things, don't want to do that. No one wants to rent that property after they know the history. Yeah. And unfortunately, we have to disclose what's happened in there. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's pretty challenging. Mm. I've seen a few of them over the years. Um, I think I had two murders myself just in my own properties. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> just throwing it out there, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had about maybe five burned out of my own properties once given. <laughs> didn't do it. No, great paydays, but, uh, yeah. I haven't come across any, any arson, which right. is a good thing because that's always the worst case scenario. Yeah. At least with a, with a murder, you can get in after the police have done their bit and yeah. clean up and get it back on the market. It's, oh, I cleaned up when my insurance paid out. <laughs> 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 but, uh, literally five. Literally five. Oh, they're investigating because they thought that I was doing something, but they found all oh, these yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, There's all the sus, like hundreds of properties, and it just <laughs> happens. So. Um, yeah. Cool. And what's the um, most surprising thing that a tenant has ever done on a property that you've seen? Um, probably over here, and yeah. it was housing snakes. Um, okay. The big containers that they have them in, but also just free form on the floor and on the couch and oh, things yeah. like that. Uh, yeah, not something that we're akin to over there. You come across <laughs> snakes, you don't want to even walk through the door. Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> yeah. want to either. Mate. I wouldn't want to either. Yeah, it's surprising for me. If you had to deal with a snake or a spider, which one would you prefer to be around? Probably a snake. 
You'd prefer to be around a snake than a spider. spider. I, I don't like your spiders over here. Wow. I live on a farm and I've never really been attacked by a snake. Touch wood. If I could probably get one in my bed tonight. <laughs> but um, I'm always scared about a snake because they can go real fast at you, right? At least a spider. Yeah. It's like, there you go. I was going to climb up the wall or whatever. <laughs> but a snake, like, that's yeah. different. Yeah. I got stung by a spider and went, put a thought in my arm. Just randomly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If you could design the perfect rental property and have the perfect sort of tenant come through, what would the perfect rental property be like? And yeah, in your eyes, perfect rental property to attract the perfect tenant um, to have all the comforts of home. Um, make sure that it's not drafty. It's not. Um, it's not old, of course, if you're yeah. building a new one. You've got quality appliances that people want to be there. They want to look after it. Yeah. They want to treat it like it's their own. Um, yeah. That makes our job so much easier when people want to live in the property. Yeah. Right? And I think like what I see all the time with property management, like just from my view of what you're dealing with, when you've got a, you could have two units. It could be in the shittest unit block in Sydney, right? <laughs> And you could have one that's done up neat and tidy, and it's not renovated with snake appliances in it, but it could just be neat and tidy. And you've got one that's got dirty carpet and this and that next thing, and the owner doesn't want to spend the money. And naturally, the applications, you're going to get the dregs and the down and outers that will be like, okay, I'll take whatever I'm given. And you've got the, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. But we find that we, we house tenants longer yeah. when the property is more suitable to their needs. And, yeah. Investors have to understand that the turnover of the tenant costs money. Yeah. All right. We can do six month leases. We can increase the rent every six months. Um, so that's always a good thing. But if you can keep a tenant happy in there and they're paying their rent on time, look after them. Yeah. Look after them. And if it's if it means putting in an AC yeah. in the stinking hot summer, you know, fifteen hundred dollars yeah. now. Will yeah. return itself, you know, tenfold over the lifetime. So, especially as we're jacking those rents up, Chris. Exactly. <laughs> well, if we've got a reason to jack the rents up even more than what it is, um, the tenant understands. If yeah. we've done maintenance to it before, we've done the rent increase. Yeah. We can put it up more. Yeah. So, and they understand. We're, oh, yeah. With he's put an AC in for us. He's replaced the cooktop. He's done whatever. Yeah. yeah I'm happy to pay that. Yeah. Cool. You know, so. We don't get the pushback. Could you log into the phone? I've got some videos to share with you guys. So thanks for the intro, Chris. Um, we've got lots of questions for Chris tonight, so hang around and uh, keep on the keep on the watch. I'm going to jump into a few news articles. I've got a few news articles, and I've got two videos I'm going to share with you. So this video here, I think, is really fun. Um, this is from. A chap that I used to admire, actually. I, I don't admire any politicians nowadays, but um, I used to, uh, growing up in a liberal household, I was like, oh, the liberals, you know, whatever. And uh, Peter Costello, right? Peter Costello is renowned as being a great treasurer and all that sort of stuff. I don't get into politics because I hate them all. They're all, you know, politically atheists. But uh, everyone thinks the politicians are going to come and save them, but really the politicians are really middle management in the system. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I've got a video here, which I've been saying a lot of weird and wacky things over the years. And I laughed when they were going to print, when they started printing all the, the money throughout Corona. And I said, we're going to end up in a trillion dollars worth of debt. And if they try to increase interest rates, the government's going to go broke. And I've said this many times over. And I laugh and I, uh, you know, I'm pretty tame, I think, tonight, actually, Chris. Maybe you're <laughs> making me tame, right? It's only early. <laughs> it's only early, it is, right? But um, here's... A very well regarded pro former politician, a decade in the second top seat of Australia, allegedly that people see, that's all the hands behind, and he's in charge of all the future funds, the CEO of Channel mm -hmm. 9, etc. It's one thing to borrow a trillion dollars, as we in Australia are not quite there, but pretty close, at 1%. Yes. It's, it's another thing to borrow a trillion dollars at four percent even if you just held your debt steady at a trillion the cost of it the interest cost yep. is going to go from about 10 billion to 40 billion it's going to go up 30 billion dollars right by about what 20 30 
Well, yeah, as, it, as it rolls around. As it rolls around. Right. Oh, yeah. no, I'm just talking about projection. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. six yeah. or seven years' time now. Yep, yep. Before some of it's already it. rolling up, by the way. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah. it's when your bonds roll off, you know, and some of it won't roll off for uh, another five years and some your very small amount won't roll, roll, roll off for 10 years. But on average, over time, you know, what we were borrowing at 1% will move to whatever the rates are now, 4%, let's say. That's $30 billion of extra interest. Well, $30 billion, just to put this in context, that's that's the Medicare system. <laughs> the <laughs> whole healthcare system. Let's put that in perspective, right? The whole fucking healthcare system uh, is what the interest bills got up, right? And he goes on to say, this is, this is the funniest part, right? That's just your cost. Yeah. And whether the most, recent, the whether most recent budget here schools, in Australia said the fastest, for, here's, a, here's, a, here's a trick question, fastest growing area of government spending in the last year, interest, interest yes. costs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the funny thing is, is that we've been saying this, I sound really off my head when I say it, Chris, because I always said people get pushing these interest rates up but everyone's worried about, oh, the homeowner's going to go broke, the investor's going to go broke, etc. The government's going to go fucking bankrupt, right? And that's exactly what the former treasurer, the deputy prime minister of Australia, is now saying that, and he's bagging out the liberal government that put the debt in place, right? The size of Medicare, $30 billion. He talks about, like, oh, it's just an extra $30 billion. There's nothing to worry about. That's the size of the problem that we got because it's not the governments that are going broke, it's not the homeowners that's going broke, it's the businesses that are going broke. Businesses are going broke every day. Every time you go onto the news website, there's another company that's gone bust. There's construction, administration, transport, construction, transport mm. no matter what. So, you know, we've got the budget that just came out last week and they're saying, oh, the budget's going to be in the surplus. It's not going to be in the surplus because we've got a trillion dollars worth of debt that's still there packaged up in off-balance sheet transactions. So we're now in a position where the US has less than two weeks to roll over their debt of $31.6 trillion. $31.6 trillion. They've got over a trillion dollars of debt per year interest on that debt, right? Our whole debt here in Australia is their interest payment per year there. They can't roll this shit over. The only way to get through this is for them to re retract and uh, change the course of monetary policy for us to go back to where we were. And as it gets worse in the next month, two months, six months, 12 months, they're going to have to rapidly patch up what they've done mm. and probably end up in negative interest rate territory. So interest rates went up a fortnight ago. And uh, people are concerned about what's happening out there, and with good reason, because the uh, RBA said that we wouldn't see interest rate rises until 2024. Everyone went and spent money based on that. Yeah. And now it's not even 2024. We've seen the interest rate go up from 10 basis points to 400 basis points. So it's 4,000% 4, higher than what it was the bonds were a year ago, which is just amazing. It's just amazing because we've got... You know, the the budget that came out last week and everyone's like, oh, yeah, what's in it for me? And we'll go through a little bit of that budget, but this is a whole pile of more commie spending. The only way for them to get through as inflation is occurring everywhere, the debt is being inflated. The interest bill is being inflated. So that's got to be passed on. The business that has debt now has to pass on an extra cost. So further inflation, further inflation until we end up in a hyperinflation scenario. Luckily enough for us that are watching this, that have debt, that have assets, the assets are getting inflated away. Your rents are getting inflated away if you've managed via Blink because uh, that's what we do is we keep up with inflation and we're ahead of the market <coughs> with strategy. Um, and your debt is becoming more and more worthless because it's just you know, getting washed away. A decade ago, a trillion dollars seemed like a lot. Now it's just thrown about, oh, it's just the interest bill, a trillion bucks. Don't worry about that. That's just over there. <laughs> it's, it's insane. And I guess from, from our perspective, we talk about inflation, we talk about price rises going across the board on all industries. But I'm happy to say that we have managed to keep our... Um, our fees, our charges, uh, consistent throughout this. So, yeah. you know, we're looking after you guys, trying to help where we can um, to make sure that your investment portfolios are not really hurting. 
And I guess our success is like, this thing I always look at when it comes to property management is like most property managers out there will be like, if you've got a thousand properties, you've got to put a thousand rents up. That means you can have a thousand tenants coming complaining. That's how most real estate agents look at it. But I see that if we put out a thousand rents up by 50 bucks, there's 50,000 a week extra, 50,000 a week extra, 52 weeks in the year, that's two and a half million, 2.6 million. If we're doing that activity, then as a business, we'll be getting 2.6 million plus that time of our management fee. We're going to earn lots of money because we're going to increase our fees too. <laughs> but our fees haven't gone up. We haven't added new fees and all those sorts of things, which Great. a lot of agents are doing now. They're actually adding in all these extra fees. So the only ones that we have to move with the times is fixed cost. People that uh, we utilize for marketing, for example, for real estate, for a domain, they put their fees up. Uh, they pass that on directly to us. We have to pass that direct cost on. That's that's the only one. But we're not making really. markups and stuff no. like that. So mm, not at all. Got a cool chart to share with everyone. Talking about what's happening with the interest rates. Chris actually asked me before we hopped online. He goes, "What's happening with interest rates? Right, they're going up." And I, I said to him, "I looked at the the um, the the thirty day interbank cash rate futures, which is still showing a very like last week it went up in the short term, but the bottom end is still right down. So." This chart that I've been following for 15 years now broke. It broke in February 2020 and uh, it went back on course. And now it's broken last month or this month um, tremendously. So the one thing is very evident though. I'm looking at the US Treasuries here. And the US Treasury is always a good sign of what's happening with monetary policy. So there's a thing called a yield curve inversion. And it's where shorter term bonds are paying a greater rate of, uh, of, of, of return than a longer term bond. And having a look here, and if, I'll just share it quickly with the, with the, with everybody watching. Um, you can see that the shorter term bonds are at the top of the screen, which are all in the green and the positive. The longer term bonds are in the red. The longer term bonds derive where the interest rate's coming from. Generally, a 10 year bond is based on where the interest rate uh, currently sit. So if we look at this here, this is just from CNBC, a 10 year bond is 3.46%. And they're coming down, which is interesting. But the shorter term bonds, like a one month bond is 5.85%. So that's 2.5%, 2.4% uh, higher. So it's like 80% more than a 10 year bond. So what happens at that point is where the bonds, like if you invest your money for three months, you should be getting less than what you've been investing it for a year or 10 years. But what happens when the yield curve inverts, the longer term bonds pay a lesser return, the shorter term bonds pay a higher return, which signals an inversion to the yield curve, which is in reverse. And generally within 14 months, we see a massive recession. And this has been going on for about 12 months anyway, um, which is exciting because the bigger this recession becomes, the bigger printing that they're going to do. The more printing they do, the more debt that they're going to have to go and take on. The more debt they're going to take on, the cheaper that it's going to have to become and the more benefit because of inflation. So all the people that have debt, the debt becomes relevant with inflation and the assets go up, the rents go up and exciting things happen. So I've got another video. And uh, this is just before I get into the banks collapsing. Uh, this one here is uh, kind of interesting, right? This is from the World Economic Forum. Right? They predicted that Corona would come out and there'd be a disease where everyone would need to be uh, inoculated. But this is, this is their newest one. And I thought it's more fun because it's like they seem to guess, right? They're just like, they've guessed it. They've chosen, they've got it right. Right? Do whatever they tell you to do, right? They've got it right. They're the masters. They are, um, they're the, the, the God of today that everyone should bow down and obey, obey without questioning. And, um, you know, these are the things that people are just following by blind, blind faith by watching too much news. But let's get in. Most worms in history, the 2003 slammer Sapphire worm doubled in size approximately every 8.5 seconds, infecting over 75,000 devices in 10 minutes and almost 11 million devices in 24 hours. Fortunately, at least until now, cyber attacks have not impacted our health the way pandemics have, but the economic damages and therefore the cyber the attack might impact our health. How would that be? <laughs> you see, the only 
only way to stop the exponential propagation of a COVID-like cyber threat is to fully disconnect the millions of vulnerable devices from one another and from the internet. For well, riches for yourself. This in a matter of days. yourself a bit more. A single day without the internet would cost our economies more than 50 billion US dollars. And that's before considering the economic and societal damages should these devices be linked to essential services, such as transport or healthcare. As the digital realm increasingly merges with our physical world, the ripple effects of cyber attacks on our safety the just keep expanding at a faster pace than the physical world. Yeah. COVID-19 yeah. was known as an anticipated risk. So is the digital the anticipated. Let's be better prepared for that one. The time is now. There we go, guys. The time is now. You better go and register yourself for all these digital identities. Get yourself into a digital world, and uh, you know, be prepared. Do what they do. What these entities tell you to do. Don't ask any questions. If you step out of line, go and find the people who are stepping out of line. Report them to the authorities and uh, take out the pitchfork tool. It's interesting, right? Like, that's just something I saw the other day. I was completely disgusted by, it. Um, and looking at. You know, the sort of, the things that we have in store for us. I actually talked about this. I did a Facebook Live. I don't know where I, I actually did the Facebook Live the day before I got Corona. <laughs> <laughs> I did the Facebook Live and I was talking about a digital world that we'll be going into, um, digital credit system, um, all these things that we're going to have that are going to go wrong. And uh, it's funny now that they're coming out talking about the next big threat is going to be that. The next big threat is going to be green energy and we have to go and convert everything to green. And I think that could be, we could probably do a, a whole uh, episode on um, the things that I think they're going to force upon property owners later on in another five years time about compliance and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah, well, it's, it's happening internationally. It's happened in New Zealand. It's happening up in the Gold Coast. Yeah. Uh, in Queensland, sorry. So it's a matter of time. Yeah. It will happen um, with the, the government that we've currently got um, advocating for tenants' rights. It's a fait accompli. Uh, there will be more tenant rights. So it's our job to make sure that you guys are protected from those rights, basically. Yeah. I think a lot of the time, most real estate agents there are there to look after the rights of the tenant. They're very pro-tenant, not pro-landlord, which is what, you know, what we need to look at. Yeah. Talk about rights. Um, here's, a, here's an article from Reuters, and it says, short selling comes under fire as regional banks sell off. This is very important because we're now at a position where they are stopping short selling, right? So they're trying to control the ability for people to be able to crash a bank and create a bank run because the banks are falling at a faster rate than ever. Last time I did a Facebook Live, I said that we're going to see another 11 or 12 banks ready to go and blow up. We had two blow up after that. And there's still probably another 20 now that are piling up. So these banks are dropping fast, um, which is very, very interesting. This article here, is probably one of the most exciting things that I can see. Uh, Chris is like, oh, no, you can't say this. And kind of we're lucky we're not posting it on, <laughs> on the Blink page because there's a lot of tenants out there that be like, these guys here are, you know, terrible. They're trying to get every cent they can out of us. But uh, look, it's, uh, it's, it's happening out everywhere. We need to treat our investing commercially. We need to treat our investing like a business. Um, a lot of people, you know, don't, uh, just buy properties for hobbies and whatnot. They don't treat it like a business and that's where they fail. I've had so many people like, when we're buying a property, you probably see it as well, Chris, uh, like with all the properties that we buy, when we buy a property, I'm finding on average, specifically in Queensland and Perth and whatnot, um, these properties are going up about 50 to 100 bucks a week. I, I was saying about 70 bucks a week before, but I've seen them go up more like 100 bucks a week now. Um, in a lot of areas, when we're buying the properties. And it just goes to show me that the properties are so mismanaged, the cash flow and the revenue management doesn't match up. And you know, as a part of being a property investor, you need to ensure that you know, you've got the revenue coming through to match your investment. So um, this article here, like we, we, every time we go to fill up with petrol, the petrol's more expensive. Every time we go to get food, um, Ridwan, which I'm doing a... a 
webinar tomorrow night. If you haven't registered for the webinar, uh, make sure you do. We're going to talk about uh, super funds, going to talk about, maybe not so much super funds, but I'm going to talk about them. Uh, so make sure you do register for the webinar. Uh, and I will be also, uh, Rudman will be covering off on tax, how to save tax and all that sort of stuff. But he just sent me a, a picture beforehand of dinner. He was out having dinner and um, it was a chicken club sandwich. Right, chicken club sandwich it's like a sandwich. It's dressed up nicely and has a few chips on the plate, right? So chicken sandwich and chips. How much do you think in an overinflated world that that would cost? Twenty six dollars. Fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. <laughs> Fifty bucks. Right. Fifty bucks. I will share that picture into Birchfeed shortly. So after this, uh, I'll share it to Birchfeed just so you guys can have a bit of a laugh, right? But 50 bucks for a fucking sandwich and chips, right? <laughs> and they look like a handful of Smith chips, right? This cold chips, not even cooked ones, right? <laughs> um, so everyone's copying increases when it comes to expenses in their day to day life. And we need to be able to pass those expenses on. Uh, most people, at the moment are focusing on debt and interest. Yes, if you've taken out a million dollar loan on a property that you live in, you have to pay for that. But if you've taken out a 200 grand loan or a 150 grand loan or a 250K loan and you're getting 400 bucks or 500 bucks a week rent and your your property, you can put the rent up 100 bucks here, 50 bucks there, well, your income could possibly be going up greater than the expenses that you have. And that's where it comes to revenue management. And I don't think that there's anyone in the country talking about property investing or talking about property management in the format of that. They're just looking at, okay, we've got the tenant there, we've got this, we've got that, hopefully it'll go up, put a nice little flow chart on. I don't have those charts, but it's managing that cash flow. And if you can manage your cash flow better, all successful businesses manage their cash flow. Looking as a successful property investor, they need to manage their cash flow as well. And um, it's definitely what, what causes um, you know, demand to go up. One is more money going into the system, creates inflation. Um, if you're not just levering, if you don't have the levers because obviously there's tightening happening out there in the, in the, in the financial markets, what other things are there? I said at the start of all this shit going down that we would need to, um, print money and we'll have to print passports, right? And we'll have to have people migrating to the country. And here's an article from news.com. Tight rental squeeze forecast as more than 700,000, right? Let's just get that fucking clear for everyone. 700,000 migrants flock to Australia by 2024. Fucking people are refugees everywhere. There's people refugee from Melbourne to bloody Queensland, right? They're trying to escape bloody communist shit down in Melbourne. We've got 700,000. We just, how do we print our debt, right? Peter Costello before him was there going, our interest rate was $10 billion at 1% on 10, on, on a trillion dollars, 1% was $10 billion a year. Now it's gone up to 4%. That's $40 billion a year. It's gone up $30 billion, which is the size of Medicare, right? The, the, um, Someone just said the text is backwards on the screen, Nath. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> from the, from the things. Front facing camera. Yeah. Um, so uh, with the, um, what was I going to say? Yeah. So how do we pay the extra expenses that are coming to us as a nation? Well, if we, we can't breed quick enough to have more slaves, right? We're a slave driven system. Everyone thinks they live in the land of the free, but they're the most enslaved and trapped people by being a tax slave in the system. How do you, you know, get ourselves through that? We just need more tax slaves and we can't breed quick enough to get more tax slaves. So we have to find them from elsewhere. So we have migration and we have more people coming in. Then they need to work and earn and that money gets through and helps service the debt that we've got. So if we look at anything, we can just increase supply and uh, increase demand and lower supply. So when we talk about 700,000 new migrants coming to the country, like we can't keep up. Like I don't even have the stats here of how many properties we build a year. Even if we wanted to keep up to building, we've got a rental shortage at the moment. We've got inability for people to be able to go buy shit. 
Imagine what will happen when we throw 700,000 more people. Let's say there's a husband and wife, and let's say they've got two kids. Let's say there's like 200,000, 300,000 more dwellings that we need. <clears throat> Even if we had the ability to build, the fucking builders have gone bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> there's no builders out there, right? There's no um, materials to build it with. There's no <laughs> materials to build it with. And the cost is... And I don't think that there's no materials in none of these things. I think that people don't want to work for the money because they're not getting enough income. I don't think that people want to sell and part with their materials because the cost that they're getting in money because of inflation isn't good enough for it. So we've got a real seize up in the system. So there's a pent up of demand with the amount of stock we've got plus all these you know, migrants that are coming through. There's some key areas that are very, very um, exciting, which I'll touch on briefly now. I've got lots more news articles to go through. But we found in Sydney, when we had corona occur, I call it, I've never said that word with the 19 and stuff <laughs> like I just can't say it because I don't buy into the shit. But um, the things that happened, there were some very dense migrant markets, right? You know the markets I'm talking about, without going into suburbs and that, um, like southwest Sydney and you know western Sydney and stuff like that. Those markets were hit and rents actually declined. But you know, something that was renting for three uh, for 330, 350 bucks a week went down to 250 a week. And I mm-hmm. remember I did the uh, four years ago, I did the open homes myself. Three years ago, I did the open homes myself every Saturday. When I when we moved in this office, I'd actually painted the walls, would just change properties management software and all these things. And I did the open homes myself, and I was like I knew how tight that it was. It was no, like no one would turn up to an open home. Now there's like a lineup of people going through open homes. There's, there's, we're seeing a big change. So something that I was looking at, one of our portfolio reviews where we got the investor 1100 bucks a week extra rental income the other week across his portfolio. And it's a humble portfolio. Um, he, um, his property, I was doing a research into each and every single property going through every one in his portfolio. And I was amazed, right? The suburb that was renting for 350, entry price 350, went down to 250. And now it's gone back to like 300, 330 in the last, you know, 12 months. It has now gone up to 500 bucks entry price into that, into that suburb. Mm-hmm. And these areas were very <clears throat> similar to areas like Mount Drew it back throughout the last 20 years, right? And it's like, if these families can afford these payments, what will happen? We'll push out and have the ripple effect. It's not happening right now in every market, but literally the the rents, we haven't seen these 700,000 people arrive yet, right? We haven't seen the demand, but migrant-based locations, they go to an area, whether it's Indian community, whether it's Asian community, whether it's Middle Eastern community, whether it's a Muslim community, and they have their communities. They're the areas which have been hit the hardest. They haven't had a boom in the last cycle, and the opportunities are amazing there. And quite literally, you can buy in Sydney with a 10% rental return today, right? 10% return. And that's unheard of. People, if you went to a barbecue and said, oh, I bought a property for 300 grand this week, and it's given me a 10% rental return, they're gonna be like, you're a liar, right? You, <laughs> you can't do that, right? But um, they, these things are happening. so. Yeah, I'm excited because when you look at specific markets, like we're looking here in Sydney, Sydney is the doormat to the country. Right? People come to Australia, they don't go, oh, I'm going to go and move to Australia and go to this place called Tamworth, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go to this place called bloody, I don't know, I'm making up some orange, right? Mm-hmm. Dubbo, right? They go, oh, I'm going to fucking Sydney, I'm going to go to Melbourne, I'm going to go to, to Perth, I'm going to go to Gold Coast, I'm going to go to Brisbane. and. Um, or large regional areas. And the other thing as well that I've noticed is not just here in Australia, is when we had the GFC, I saw they open up the floodgates and there were so many migrants, right? So a lot of migrants, just in my own lifetime, I've seen Australia like multicultural diversify where, um, where I grew up and whatnot. And, and I look at it now and it's like, the, the, if you're a doctor in China. If you're a doctor in India, you come to Australia, you're not a doctor anymore, right? You have to be, you have to go to a regional hub, work for 10 years, you get renowned as a doctor and you can keep your, so they want skilled workers, right? So they push them in there. So they had Western Sydney as skilled workers. They made it like regional as being Western Sydney. 
that filled up a decade, to about 15 years ago. But now they've gone to a lot of areas. So if you look at the Gold Coast and Perth, those areas become migrant cities or mi migrant regions. So you could go there and migrate there. Yeah. Those areas have boomed now over the last two or three years. And then now we've got new areas which no one's even talking about, which are, you know, they're allowing migrants to come to to fill up those regions. And those regional areas are renting for, you're buying a property for 150K and it rents for 400 bucks a week. And it's like people think those numbers aren't achievable. They're, they're out there. But I think this is amazing. You can either print money or just print people. <laughs> <laughs> this is another way out of it. Yep, they all earn, they all create taxes, they all spend. Yeah. And as long as they're doing it in the right way, paying the rent first, it's not an issue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that um, takes me to this this last article. I think we're going to keep it at maybe three yeah, three articles today. This one is just like about the budget that went on last week, which we know it's a lot of crap. But it says here, um, the Treasury reveals bigger surprise federal budget. Um, and I saw it in here somewhere... Before and there's like money being spent for NDIS, which is you know just going to go out there. Um, Four billion to realising our future of renewable energy superpower, bringing the government's total investment to more than forty billion dollars. Um, so I found that a lot of these coal locations that we've been investing into um, for pennies in the dollar. I mean, like you know, ten cents in the dollar to pay, compared to what they used to sell for. There's so much infrastructure because they're taking out all the coal. Everyone's worried about coal. And then they're going, well, we'll give you $20 billion over here and $5 billion over there. You get rid of that dirty coal and you put in hydrogen. So there's all these hydrogen projects that are going on mm -hmm. and these locations are going nuts, right? And we knew it before it happened because we could see where all the, the money was flowing to, which is cool. And a lot of people don't look at those things. I don't think there's any property manager out there looking at macroeconomics and going, okay, what's happening with energy and coal and commodity prices? Um, <laughs> it's just true. No one does that. You've been in it for how many years, right? You've never seen anyone talk about it. Like um, so there's, there's uh, stimulus packages into clean energy, which we knew would come. Um, and then looking at um, the rents, right? It says if you're in job seeker, you get an extra $2.85 a day, you still live in poverty. The Commonwealth rent assistance has gone up by $1.12 per day. The average rents have gone up 10 times greater. So now there's talks of them actually doing massive rent assistance programs, right? Yeah. Where if we're dealing with bread and butter investments and bread and butter properties, then we're going to see a lot more... Um, growth in those areas, right? So like people think, oh, if I buy a property for a million dollars and it rents for 800 bucks a week, it's a great investment. If you buy a property for 300 grand and you're getting 400 bucks a week, the worst case scenario is Centrelink and rent assistance is going to help out. So there's a lot more people and a lot more pent up in demand for government support. So if they start issuing free money to people and doing stimulus packages for people being able to, to rent and to look after their, their baseline, yeah. um, potentially tied to a social credit system, potentially tied to a new digital identity, all those sorts of things. They're trialling these, you know, those New South Wales back to school grants that give you those vouchers. Um, there's a lot of potential for rent stimulus checks to come out. And I think investors don't realise that there's ways money will flow to them. But, yeah. Some of the richest people I know are the biggest Centrelink recipients of the country. Right? <laughs> they are. Literally, like, what about all our tenants? How many tenants would be getting some sort of child assistance, family tax benefit, oh, yeah. part A, B, whatever it is, right? That money flows through the economy and then everyone's got the opportunity to spend that on whatever they need to. So, it's, uh, yeah. Anyway... I digress. I've covered up a lot of uh, our time today on, on these things. <laughs> um, That's fine. Chris, how do we get the best rents out there? How do we? How do you negotiate? You know, people will be watching this going, yeah, my interest rate's gone up, thanks. Uh, my food, my $50 chicken sandwich, to get me a basic food or whatever, has gone up. Uh, how do I get some of the extra cash flow coming through? Like, if you've got one job, well, then you've got one stream of income. If you've got 10 properties and you've got 10 streams of income, 
how can you maximise that? How do you negotiate and how do you get the tenants to pay up and how do you make it? Um, every stakeholder, I guess, being, you know, loved and respected. You know, it's not, I saw something about a greedy agent today that's like, oh, tenants are, you know, talking negative about tenants. Like, we're pro landlords, but at the end of the day, if you don't have a tenant, you don't have cash flow. Yeah, you mm-hmm. don't have the cash flow. So you need to manage and balance that very carefully and, yeah. and with, with compassion too. So, how so do I think we... we've, we've been going through a, a prolonged period now of rental reviews. Um, as the rates have gone up, our rents as they come off lease or ones that haven't been um, reviewed in quite a long period of time because the market hasn't moved, yeah. we're, we're researching it. We're understanding the communities that we own property or you guys own properties in that we manage and we're looking at those communities and finding out the demographics of it the as nathan was saying before um one particular suburb has gone off basically because it's attracting a certain um, nationality and they all want to be in the same environment they're all coming in with qualifications they've got money to spend so they flock together, we do the research, we find out where it's going to go, and we offer that to the owner saying, we believe the price that you could achieve for your property is X dollars. They come back and say, yes, I think we'll go for that. Thank you very much, good. We go back to the tenant and say, look, sorry mate, your, your rate's going to go up by $50, $70 a week. Um, it's gonna happen on this day, can you just, you know, give us an indication of where you're at. And nine times out of 10, we'll get pushback. Now, we don't come back to the owners and say, look, we've got pushback on this. Um, we take it upon ourselves to, to negotiate with the tenant, sell the tenant the value of the increase. So I think we'll probably come back to the owners maybe 10% of the time and say, look, we really believe this guy's not going to stay, that the increase is not going to work for him. Our options are, so we either reduce the, the increase and we keep the tenant in there if they're looking after it and they're paying on time and they're a good tenant, or we turn it over again um, and rent it out for what we believe we can get. So we don't come back to you guys and say, look, there's pushback on the tenant on this every single time that we get it, because that's not your responsibility. It's our responsibility to negotiate. And as I say, nine times out of 10, we'll get the desired result for you. So when you come back to us and say, I think we need X number of dollars more than what we recommend, then we get the pushback because it is not quite the right uh, methodology for us to employ. So please trust us. Uh, We understand the market. We negotiate your um, business on your behalf. And we do a good job of it. So we get the returns. I'm, I'm seeing so much negligence. I'm going to use that word out there in the market. Like, it doesn't matter what state we're buying in. doesn't matter what state we're renting them in. I'm seeing negligence like where leases have just been renewed in March 2023 and it's May 2023. So they would have had to put the increase up in February <coughs> or whatever. January, <laughs> January yeah. February, come March, April. And they've relet a property that should be like three fifty a week for two forty. Just re-sign the lease because the property manager's lazy and they haven't done their job and they haven't been proactive to see, okay, what can we do for our landlord? A lot of property managers are like, oh, well, I don't want a thousand tenants whinging, but they're not looking at the fact of, okay, what does our investor need, right? What does the person that we represent need from that? And you know, seeing our investors, I work very closely with my finance team and looking at. Okay, like I was talking to one of our investors, um, you, you've got one of their properties vacant, you've got an open home tomorrow, and you're talking about it beforehand. Um, I said to that investor, like they're failing for servicing like six grand a month, something like that, right? To be able to service, to get their dream home, right? And I was like, okay, well, we've been thinking about, okay, how do we structure to get the dream home for this person? And I said, send me over all of your rents. And I went through every property, and I'd say maybe, 15 out of 20 properties were with us and some of them were in areas that we couldn't manage beforehand and we're not managing, yeah? Yep. And we need to bring them back. And we're able to put up rents there, I think about 600 bucks a week, right? And that's just today's batch of 600 bucks a week. So if we go 
20 bucks here, 50 bucks there, 80 bucks there, 100 dollars here, all those numbers. And then another six months, we come back and do that again. We might get 600 a day and another 600 in another six months. That could be 1200 bucks a week. That's 4,800, 5,200, whatever per month. That helps that investor be able to service, to be able to get to their dream home. Mm -hmm. And property managers aren't out there thinking about how can I get my investor to live in the dream home. They're like, oh, this investor has five properties, 10 properties, 20 properties. Generally, they only have one or two properties in a real estate office. Have you seen anyone with more than five properties in a real estate office beforehand? A couple of times, but not very often, yeah. Would you think of any of our clients or you'd be like, shit, I don't know many that have less than five properties because they're they're all, well, Mm. they start with a couple, but they're they're building these large portfolios as professional investors. Right. And it's like, how do the property, how does the property manager manage your assets if they don't know what you need? If they don't know what, what's going to help you reach your goal? Like, you've got, we've got a, a, I call her a VIP client, right? She's great. She's got like 30 properties. She's going to get 30 properties. She's at like 27 or something now. I think she did 28th one today. We're going to get it at 30 shortly in like two years, right? Not even two years, 18 months or something. And, um, I had a chat with her about a month ago and said, look, we need to put this rent up, this rent up, this rent up. It puts the rent up and it helps the servicing. And if it wasn't for those actions, those little tweaking of the portfolio, she wouldn't be refinancing the properties with a big four bank now. And then she wouldn't be able to get the cheap interest rates to save her another 10, 20 grand a year. And they're things that, you know, they all play a role in the overall view of someone building wealth in a nice, you know, a nice asset base. And if you're not managing that cash flow correctly and aggressively. I bought a property the other day for someone. It was a duplex pair. I'm not going to say where it is or anything like that. It's the most, the worst thing I've ever seen in real estate, right? It is literally, <laughs> like it is the worst thing I've ever seen, right? I'll explain. I did a video specifically on this and it's going to go out, but I'll share it here today. People, like you go on the news sometimes and you'll see, oh, there's been a drug deal that got shot, right? Or someone being killed in a bad drug deal, right? I've never touched drugs. People think I'm off my fucking head, right? I think I might be on the spectrum, right? But people think, get that confused. Oh, Bert, she must have done a bag of coke or something, right? But I have seen certain things happen out there in the world beforehand that where people, things go wrong, right? And pow, 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 right? Shooting up, right? And uh, that's what happens when you grow up in Western Sydney. But, you know, um, I've seen, I've heard of people getting shot killed for a drug debt of 20 grand or 10 grand or 50 grand, right? This real estate agent had the fucking hide of selling a property, right? 320 grand for two duplex pair, right? So 160 grand per unit, right? I saw it and I saw it's rented for $310 per week. I assume per side. We went and double checked. No, no. <laughs> it's got a great tenant in there. They're rented. I've signed up for another two year lease to expire in May 2025, right? <laughs> right? May 2025. So literally two fucking years. I said, what should it rent for? Like, what could we get for rent? Just being a smart ass to the real estate agent. They go, oh, if the tenant wasn't in there, you'd get $350 per week per side. And I'm like, okay, 310. What, what do you mean by that? And they go, well, one's rented out for one, for 150 and one's rented out for 160, right? And that's 310 a week. So you're fucking telling me, right? You just signed a lease for two fucking years at $400 a week less than what it should be getting. 400 bucks a week. Is 20 grand a year, two years is 40 grand. That owner has been fucked by 40k, right? As I said, people have died for less and the real estate agents got the listing to sell the property, go, oh, I've done a great job, buy it for fucking 320k. <laughs> oh, this thing should be 500 grand, right? But stupidity. This, the owner that's selling it is stupid for selling the property so cheap. The owner is stupid for trusting their real estate agent. The real estate agent, I don't know, is stupid or is fucking idiot, is mentally retarded, or dodgy. I don't know, right? All of the above. Mm. But I love them. <laughs> because if they didn't fuck the owner over, our investor wouldn't be able to buy that property cheap, right? But there's idiots out there every day. So people say, why do you buy a property? Or why would someone sell a property below market value? Why would someone sign a fucking two-year lease for $150, $160 per week when you can get fucking 350 bucks a week? Dickheads, right? If they're watching it, 
They'd probably be watching it. I don't know. They wouldn't be watching because they'd be fucking watching stupid TV or something at this time of the day because it would be an idiot, right? Because an idiot would rent their property like that and lock it in in such a long lease. Why? It doesn't make any fucking sense. But that person just did himself out of 20 grand a year. Dumb, right? And so many times you're getting properties and they're renting for 250 a week in Sydney and it's like, oh, no, no, we're going to put them up to 350 a week, right? And soon we'll put them up to 400 a week and... You know, your strategies of how we make them happen when the leases expire, all those sorts of things are very important for the investor's journey to maximise their, their outcome. So, yeah. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of properties that we uh, take on that you guys buy that have had rent reductions because of the time of the, the last few years and they've never been touched again. Never. So you're talking from 2020 to 2023, a lot of that is three year period of time. You've had a reduction in rent and it's stuck. We never reduced any tenant's rent, not one. Not one tenant got away with not paying a dollar of rent. When tenants, at the time of the thing that happened a couple of years ago, we didn't have to go into it because everyone know what the fuck happened in the last few years. People were like, I can't afford it, right? And tenants tried it on us. They were like, you know, there's shifty tenants, there's good tenants there, they're lovely tenants, and we want to get everyone help. And some people didn't realise that they could go and get assistance, right? There was all these assistance programs for rent support, for job keeper, job seeker, all these different types of grants that were out there, flood grants, all different things. People were sitting there saying, the commercial property's going, oh, you know, I, I, I can't afford it. It's like, well, what about we get the assistance? There was rent there from commercial properties, right? Agents were sitting there. I told my mates, I call your agent up that are renters, right? I'm like, call them up. Like, your agent's an idiot. Just tell them you can't pay for the next three months. And they got free rent. They literally got free rent, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, is working with these people like, oh, I lost my job, I can't pay the rent. Okay, do you have a letter? Can you show us that you lost it? We need to see a bit of uh, confirmation that you lost your job. Oh, here's the letter to show us made redundant. Great. Do you know what you can do with that with that letter of your redundancy? Or you may let go of your job. You can take it to fucking job keeper or uh, to, uh, what is it? What do they call it? The, I don't know, Centrelink or whatever. Yeah. And you can go get yourself 750 bucks a week, right? And with that, we can do two-thirds of your payment now and then we'll put a little debt to the side and you fix it up in the next six weeks, ten weeks. And like, okay, thank you very much. And agents are out there copying that shit and they're like, oh, we'll just drop the rents for you. And it's like, it's disgusting. So there was a landlord assistance package, $4,500 per landlord. Yeah. That came to the real estate yeah. to pay the rent. The tenant didn't even see it. Yeah. And it was a lump sum payment. It took Crazy. a lot of pain off a lot of people. Crazy. But the landlord got it all. Yeah. Mm. But rent reductions as a whole shouldn't be happening. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys, if you own a rental property and you're watching this today, like, I say things that are funny and sometimes it can be insensitive or whatever. Chris is very conservative. He's like, what am I, what am I walking into that with Nathan, right? Um, it's, if you have, if you own a property and you haven't increased your rent in the last 12 months, send a message to us. There's a link and there's an email address. Flick a message over to us and um, have a review, right? The dumbest thing you could do is trust. I spoke to a client. Actually, I've got to give you a guy's details. He wants to bring two properties over, but he's got a friend that manages <coughs> like 10 of these other properties and they're in Queensland. And I told him the rents he needed to do. And I was like, for 50 bucks, it was 50 bucks. I was like, yeah, yeah, let us look after it. He's like, oh, I know my friend. He's a very good friend. I'm like, mate, your friend's not a good friend. He's costing you 600 bucks a week from all your rents that are too low. Um, if you haven't increased your rent, if you think your agent's good, get a second opinion on it because quite possibly you're under-rented by massive amounts. So, yeah. Yeah, what I'd like to see, you know, is you're just giving us an email. Um, to the BDM New South Wales at blinkproperty.com.au. Say, I've got this property, it's rented for this much, it's had a review done by the existing property manager. What do you think? We'll research it, we'll come back and say if you're on a winner or not. 
What I'm doing all about. When I'm doing my calls with my investors, like about a half hour portfolio reviews that I'm doing, and I'm going through all the properties. So I've just said, like, so I don't have enough hours in there, but I'm booked out for like months now, just eight hour calls a day. And it's like, fuck, like, I need a break, right? Tomorrow, on Thursday's my birthday. I'm like, no, I'll book calls on Thursday. I want to go out for lunch <laughs> and enjoy my day, right? But, um, I, 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 when I'm on the calls, like, some people want to say, hey, like, if I'm contacting all the time with texting or whatever, it's like, send me your properties, your current rents. So I'm going through it myself. Mm. The team, we can't keep up with it how quickly, like, we're pushing the rents and what we're doing with them. Being strategic, um, with when we should do the increases to make sure you're maximizing that. But I'm literally sitting there and I'm giving them the notes. I go to realestate.com, I'm going through comparable rentals, comparable leases, I'm giving them the, the details of going to lower prices, to upper prices, and like, just on the lower price of getting the 1100 bucks. Imagine if we go to the higher price, we could do like 1200 bucks, 1300 bucks. So, yeah, like, reach out to Chris, reach out to the team. That's, you said it's, what, what's the email address? It's BDM. New yep. South Wales, NSW. So you'd so say BDM NSW at blinkproperty.com.au. If it's in Queensland, it would be BDM QLD at blinkproperty.com.au. So wherever your property is located, send an email over to the team um, and follow that sort of linkage that we're talking about and um, get a review because you're probably pissing up, you know, hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars a week from your yeah, you know, real estate agent not. And you too couldn't afford a fifty dollar sandwich on the increase. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um property management, right? Like people go oh, like my first job was in property management and I thought oh, a real estate yeah, agent. Was it? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah. There you go. There's a tip of advice for everybody. I was yeah. like, I thought, I want to go get a job in prop in real estate. How do I go to start scrubbing <clears throat> toilets, whatever? And I went in I got a job as a letting clerk, right? right. And yeah. uh, I was out in Western Sydney at the Star Partners real estate office, and I went just door knocking, handing out resume, and they employed me because they're like, this guy's got a bit of balls to come and say, give me a job. There's no job out, I just asked, and I thought that's what I had to do. And, um, yeah, I saw a lot of, you know, bad things out there and lots of things over the years that could be improved upon. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, like, I think, what, what do you think about communication on that front? Like good and bad in real estate, right? Like there's effective communication between landlords, owners, the medium person being yourself to, yeah, how can we minimise? Well, again, it's, it's like we understand that it's a business for you. It's mm-hmm. a, an investment. There's no emotion uh, attached to that property or the tenant is, for that matter. Yeah. So... We can be empathetic to the tenant's needs. Yeah. Um, we can be um, negotiating your interests a lot easier than you can do it because you, you know, you listen to the stories that the tenants uh, tell you, and sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, the the owner will collapse because they are big. Showing their empathy or sympathy for these people, uh, and generally it's a it's a sob story anyway, and it's not true. Um, so, but they'll play the game, they'll play the system, and having an impartial person in the middle that can look after your interests takes that all that ambiguity out of it. Yeah. So, communication for me is, yeah, it's giving you the information once we've managed to secure. Um, the increase that you require. Not to come back to you and say, oh, look, there's pushback from the tenant. They can't afford it. Would you drop the price? That's what most real estate agents do. Yeah. So you don't get to hear about all that unless it is a genuine um, request. Yeah. Yeah. They're all genuine requests, but you know, it's how it's managed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to pay higher rent. It's like, well, uh, we've seen this, these commies come out uh, from the Philip Lowe, Dr. Philip Lowe from the RBA every month, and he goes, interest rates have gone up another quarter of a percent, right? And then you, about an hour later, your bank sends you an email saying, hey, due to the interest rate rise, your interest rate has now gone up a quarter of a percent, and you've got to pay it, right? I don't hear 
the bank calling you up and saying, oh, Chris, you're a fucking nice bloke, right? <laughs> no rate hike for you this month. No one's called me up and gone, oh, Birchie, you fucking no rate hike for you. No rate hike for your grandmother. No rate hike for your, you know, friend that's going through a problem. It is, that is the market. That is the yeah. system. And, you know, you, I don't think anyone does anyone justice, right? So by not increasing their rate, the rents, in that situation I told you about in the property, which the two duplexes should be three fifty <coughs> per side per week, seven hundred bucks a week, but it's getting three ten, one fifty, one sixty. Imagine in two years' time that tenant gets off their lease, right? And they're just thinking, oh, well, I paid that. I'm happier in my house. I've been here for five years, four years. How long the real estate agent allowed them? And then the rent goes up from three hundred and fifty a week to you know four hundred and twenty. And that tenant's rent goes from 150 to 420 and they're like, I can't afford to pay this, so we'll get the fuck out of the property, put a new tenant in that can afford it. Players come, players go, just like a game of Monopoly out there. Yeah, exactly. And then the tenant's like, well, I can't afford anything for $420 a week because they've been educated at such a low rent. Yeah, it's a disservice so, to, to the tenants yeah. when they are left to pay minimum rent. Yeah, they're they're out of touch with um, society. They they freak out. I actually just seen someone that's in our live tonight, and he rented out their property the other day, right? And it's it's not located here. It's located in the Blue Mountains, actually, and um, it it was vacant. And there was three other properties in the complex for rent. And then uh, I had a chat with this client, and uh, they mentioned that um, that they. Uh, you know, should, do we drop the rent and all that? They dropped the rent by ten dollars. It was a four fifty, but the local agents. The reason why is the local agents had them on for three seventy a week, right? <coughs> the three seventy agent hasn't rented their property yet because it's mismanaged. But our one got rented at four forty, so it's like seventy bucks a week difference yep. over a big brand name real estate office. Not mentioning any names, but it was Ray White. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just it was a local real estate agent. It was actually a Ray White, and it was three hundred and seventy bucks a week with them. And ours was four hundred and forty. I was like, it's great. Like literally, by the time I hung up the phone, I said, "Go put up these rent increases. That's what we need to do with that one. Put a new strategy around because this local agent's being a dick." She texted me and said, "Oh, Andrew from your team has just got me a tenant four hundred and forty bucks a week." And it's like, great. There we go. It's like seventy bucks more than the. Funny story with that is that when our tenants that we had approved for it went back to the property to measure up, see if they could get their boat onto the section, yeah, Ray White tenant uh, agent tried to get them into their yeah. actual unit number yeah. one. So I thought that was pretty cheeky of them to try and steal that, but yeah. Crazy. They laughed at them. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. The relationship, right? The relationship as well with you, with the tenant, it depends on, you know, how receptive they are to the, to that, that news. Like, your rents have gone up, right? It's like, it's how we condition them as well throughout that process. Mm. So, yeah. Cool. And I guess, you know, in property management, like anything, like, uh, intelligence is important. Like, I, I think throughout my personal investing career, people go, oh, it's intelligent. I don't think I'm the smartest guy out there. I'm the most committed. I'll, I'll say I'll just push it like it's as far as I can push something. But in that becomes emotional intelligence. And I think a lot of people get emotional about things, right? And it's it's a, it's a game It's quite easy to, to go, oh, the tenant this or, you know, lose it at someone or someone not to keep their mind focused and sharp. But how much emotional intelligence, like... As a property manager, so what I was going before all that, I said I worked in property management. Mm -hmm. Like, I know the amount of shit that comes your way. People think, oh, it's a real estate, it was such a great job. Like, you're literally getting smashed from tenants that don't want to pay rent, don't want to cover it. Like, you've got to manage those expectations. Communication's a, a crucial part. How much of it is the, the, the emotional intelligence, do you think, that, that comes in? Um, yeah, it, it, part of property management is well, a lot of property management is experience. You get the same scenarios happening just in different properties with different people. Yeah. So if you've got strategies at play that can see through a lot of the crap that goes down, 
mm. but show empathy for it. Yeah. Yeah, like I really do understand you're in a tough spot, but this is we're, we're not here to make friends. We're here to give you the um, information of renting in New South Wales at the moment, and this is what it's going to cost you if you want to stay in that unit. Yeah. Basically, yeah, hard line. And it's... Uh, it's important to play that middle role very well, right, as a, as a property manager, because you can either go on the offence and be like, well, if you don't do this, then you're going to get out on the fucking street, or oh, as an owner, if you don't do this, whatever. You need to sit there and be like, well, I'm just trying to help you, right? This is what the owner's rights are, one, two, three. This is what the owner is intending to do. I'm trying to help mitigate this. Obviously, if you move out, it means I have to do more work to find another tenant. So I want to work with you to keep you in the property. You've been paying your rent, all those sorts of things. What do you wish to do? You can move to another property, but that's going to go up higher in rent and you know, you're going to have to pay costs for moving and all those sorts of things. That's working you out. You go to a lesser property for the same rent. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it's, I think... In any negotiation, it's important to have the empathy. It's important to have a common enemy, right? It's not me that's trying to put your rent up. It's the, the market. It's the environment. If you, it's the other properties that are on the market. It's the real estate agent you're talking to about moving to the other property that's putting their rents up, which is putting your rent up. And it's, yeah. So. Yeah. It's a compound effect across the board. And on the whole, tenants do understand that we're in a bull market at the moment. Yeah. Yes, they'll bitch and moan about it, but they are accepting of it because there is a lack of short, a lack of good quality properties, yeah. and prices are going up. So there's not a lot they can do. I just laughed internally, Chris. I just laughed internally, right? Because you said something that could be one of the funniest things in property management. Just said, right? You just said the tenant realizes that we're in a bull market. What real estate agent would be talking about bull market, right? They're, talking, they're like talking about all random stuff. You'd hear about bull markets in, in financial markets, right? And that's where we're hearing. And the, 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 the talk and the, the mindset behind the property management is like very different. It has to be different, right? And it's like when people hear bull market, they're talking bonds. They're talking about stocks. They're talking about Crypto, they're talking about, but not about rent, rents and tenancies. That's, that's pretty, <laughs> yeah. probably what we think well, about that. That's where we're at. Yeah. 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 So, and we need to manage that. Mm. We need to manage that we get our owners that we represent, like every cent that we can. And I'm noticing each month that goes by, I actually had to call up the bank earlier. Um, two things. One, I've got a new token today. So it keeps me going for another 10 years. It's a token that signs off on the big payments. Yeah. A lot of people don't realise that, yes, you know, we run property management, but I physically push the buttons on those things. I, I'm very active in the business. You come to the door, you see my name on there, it's the licensee, right? And one thing I'm noticing is that each month that goes by, when I spoke to the bank, I was like, I need you to put my upper limit of the rental payment out, right? And it, it's going over, each office is going up higher and higher. And I said, this, this, specific office where it's located. I said, that little business needs to go add an extra zero attached to it, right? And uh, yeah, they go, oh, we can get you up to 100 million per day that you can sign off. I'm like, we don't need to go to 100 million today, but just add the extra <laughs> zero to it, right? And um, when I was looking at that, it's like, why are the why is the monthly button that I'm pushing in the end of month, it was mid-month payment, yesterday mm -hmm. and then it's end of month at the end of month and the amount of income that's coming in that we're managing on behalf of we're just exponentially growing every month and our success is based on our community and our our, our people that we represent for managing their property so yeah i think that yeah i'm excited I, I actually it's one of the most exciting things this year is looking at the the revenue management of our property management business because it's yeah a lot of our investors will retire at the other side of this period that we go through. Um, yes, the interest rates have gone up. Um, I remember last time when interest rates came down, um, Linda from our office, yeah, and I was looking at her interest payments. I was like, you got a few more worth of debt there, right? And uh, the the interest rates dropped like 3%. I was like, 3% on 3 mil, that's like 90K a year that we're saving, right? 3 mil, yes, your interest bill's gone up, 
by 90k to anyone that's got a million, it's gone up by 30 grand. If you've got two mil, it's gone up by 60k. But if you can put up your rent today and cover that, and then when the interest rates drop, whether it's in six months' time, 12 months' time, 24 months' time, that spread of like, you know, the interest rates coming back down and the rent's going up, that could be 100 grand, that could be 150k. And it's literally all it takes for people to retire. But most people are sitting there being bitches and going, oh, I'm scared of this, I'm scared of that, I'm scared of the next thing. And they're going to come back and go, oh, well, now the property market's booming, let's get into it. It's like, well, you don't have the opportunity anymore mm. because the, the price of rise, the yields aren't there. Yes, interest rates are lower, but you've missed out on the other, you know, 75% of the cycle that's, that's occurring. So, yeah. Um, uh, we're living in a world like we saw at the start of tonight, if you've been watching the whole time, thanks for hanging in there with us. I feel like we're getting shadow banned sometimes and there's not as many people that are watching this, right? Because it doesn't have the greatest audience sometimes. So if you do like this, please share it with your friends and family, smash up a like, leave us a comment um, and do share it around. But um, we are talking at the start about the uh, error that we're going through and these, I'll call it the satanic occult powers that control us, right? These guys that are so smart, they know exactly what's about to happen before it happens and we're going to have an illness and these sort of things happen. They talked about, in the start of it, you can re-watch the video later, um, about um, the World Economic Forum, right? They're talking about cyber security threat that's going to happen, that's going to be worse than, worse mm -hmm. than the illness that we had and all these sorts of things. Um, we're going in a world where everything's going digital, Yeah. How do you think, you know, over the years that you've been doing property management, how do you think that the digital world will impact and the future of property management? Good question. Do you uh, think it will have an impact too much? Or? Well, we're in an industry where we are still reliant on verbal and written communications. Um, yeah. To go digitally, I can't see that that's going to give us any major benefit. Yeah. Whilst we are a relationship-based building um, industry. Yeah. So to try and separate the two, when you go faceless, you go. This is the way it goes. How do you respond to that? It's it's just not how I see it going to go anywhere. I, yeah. It, you need to human. You've got to get back to human nature on on, yeah. on some things. I came across a real estate agent today that we have just taken over a property from, and we asked them for electronic copy of the lease, the the bond, the everything that comes through. Oh, we don't do electronic. I said, okay, fair enough, right? Would well, be really you... good to get if you could scan it in. Oh, we don't do scanning. So we had to physically go to the real estate and pick up the file. Now, yeah. That is backward when it comes to technology. That is something that everyone has to move with the times if they want to communicate on an efficient platform. We pride ourselves on doing that. We can, we've got you know, good IT here, we've got good systems and we've got good technology. We can, we can do whatever we need to do. But to go to the next level, where we are a faceless entity, yeah. um, voiceless entity, and everything's there for people to look online and try and achieve, yeah. it's not the way I like to do business. It's interesting you say that, right? Because as we, um, as we think, well, I think about as we got the coast, right? Like up like further, go through Queensland. Every half an hour, you could find someone one of our representatives in a neighborhood. Like we're literally hugging the whole coast, right? Like you drive up half hour, there's someone, there's, there's, there's people that are on the ground that are covering those neighborhoods and in the communities. And today I saw these Facebook pages um, being created, which are, you know, Blink Property Western Australia, right? Blink Property Perth, Blink Property Cairns, Blink Property Townsville. and. Um, yeah, like we've got the communities, we're in the communities and, you know, it's, yes, we're centrally controlled because we operate everything from, you know, our, our, our headquarters in each state, but we've got the same processes. So if you've got a property, 
you could have a property manager could be managing your property in the Gold Coast and also managing it in Cairns, and you've got that connection with that same person, but there's the activity that's connected with the locals, which is, I think is very important. Um, I think a benefit in the future, and if you look at all the bad things that are going to come to us as a um, you know, social credit system, whether it be digital currency, digital identity, and all those sorts of things. I think as an investor, you've got the ability to, you know, if there's a sort of credit score, like you've got a, an Equifax report for a credit file or whatever, I think that that will follow tenants in the future. I think there'll be, uh, tenants will have to be better, you know, to be able to get into a property as well. So I think yeah. that that will work in on behalf. Mm-hmm. I think uh, a big part of that... Yes, Tom, I do. Sorry. <laughs> so I just said, do we do Mackay? We have hundreds of properties we manage in Mackay up there. So um, s- send me a message on here um, or send a, a message to... Um, th- reach out to the team and we'll put you in contact with the, the local uh, property manager in Mackay. So we're getting like properties that... In Mackay, we're buying properties that are renting for 260 a week and we're putting up to 400 bucks a week. Like literally, did, I'm like, how the fuck did an agent get it wrong 140 bucks <laughs> a week? <laughs> Sorry, Chris. I guess that part of that technology is forging relationships. We work in every community because we've got properties in every community, as Nathan alluded to, and we have to have electricians and plumbers and handymen and builders available in those areas to be able to service what we do. So we negotiate better pricing because of the volume of business that we put through. That's economies of scale for us. We have these jobs done in a timely manner, which if you're a Joe off the street and you ring an electrician in Musselbrook, they'll say, yeah, we'll come and see you in maybe two or three weeks' time. So because we have relationships with these people, we put a work order out for something to do with plumbing or electrical and it's done the next day yeah. you know those and it's done at a good price yeah and it's warranty warranty work so we're compliant on everything that we do we don't have you know cowboys off the street doing stuff and you taping way. electrical wiring no. exactly yeah so yeah please rest assured if you're if you've got property in a, a rural community that we've still got the same reach from Sydney um, into those areas through building relationships and making things happen. Um, and that's what it's all about. And I have Chris here today talking on behalf of Blink New South Wales because our office, uh, we've got offices in the building, offices in the park here in the Norwest Business Park. Um, we Chris is here from New South Wales. Chris looks like overseas New South Wales operations. However, um, someone's writing messages that are funny. Um, uh, um, the we have like every every just as much as I see those rents when I push the button and I have to add extra digits to to accommodate for the money to go out of the accounts. Um, I'm seeing that every week on the payroll, right? Because we've got more staff growing in every regional location. We're literally in all different locations. People wouldn't even knew these. Um, locations existed we're buying up as well like the local real estate offices in, the, in a lot of these areas as well and we're accumulating and, and growing via you know other parts so we've got connections countrywide mm. it's not just you know sydney you might have a property portfolio that's spread across you know sydney brisbane Cairns, perth geraldton right all these different locations and you could have the same team, the same infrastructure in place, managing your whole total property portfolio and getting you a higher rental return, which I think is the most important part about what we do is the cash flow management, mm-hmm. leading the massive return. We're treating our investors' portfolios like a hedge fund and making sure that they're getting the right return that they need to because every dollar really counts. So, you know. Yeah, for sure. And again, if you've got property and you don't feel it's being managed properly, let us compare for you what it should work or how it should work for you, sorry. So give me an email, bdm at New South Wales. NSW. NSW, B- BDM sorry. NSW at Blink Property. At printproperty.com.au. 
it's in the description, so check it out. Yeah. Um, and really, like, if you're paying a real estate agent and they're not earning you the extra 20 bucks or 50 bucks a week, like, we're literally paying for ourselves what it costs to manage the property. But the cost of what we charge, like, each location is different and whatnot. Um, but the location, like, we're not more expensive than a real estate office. We're not cheaper than a real estate office. We're in the middle of where most real estate agents charge. You could have some idiot managing a property out there um, that's charging lesser rent and all those sorts of things, mismanaging your cash flow, keeping you back from retiring. Or you could have Chris, you could have myself, you could have the whole team managing um, your properties to get the higher rental, the highest rental return as possible. Mm. So, yeah. The happiest tenants, the highest rental return, less turnover, everyone's on side for a win then. I remember reading a book once, and I don't read books. Right? There was only a couple of books I ever read. There was this book, it was like this girl I was dating like 20 years ago, right? And played softball, right? I'm not into sport either, so I read this book and it's from that Jim's Law Mowing guy, right? Mm -hmm. And he said about how he became successful in his systems and processes in his business was that he would stack the bag in a certain way. Instead of just cutting the lawn clippings, you'd only fit like six lawns a day worth of lawn clippings into the thing. You'd have to take the lawn tra the trailer back and dump it off and whatever. But it's how he stacked his trailer and how he stacked these bags. He could fit eight bags in, so he could do an extra two lawns, right? They get an extra 25% per day, right? Over five days, you get an extra 125% <coughs> per week of the day. And um, when you look at systemizing things, right? Like my whole journey of investing has been systemizing and processing my journey. And um, I think about if we have a property vacant for a day or a week or a fortnight or a month, right? Real estate agents like, oh yeah, you know, we'll be right, whatever. And it's taken us like, I don't say this as in like, oh, you've got the best systems in place. It's taken us 10 years of like a lot of fucking trouble of getting our business to how good it is today. It's, it hasn't come easy, it's, it's refining those processes. But I think about down to if the property is vacant for a week, right? If we've got a thousand properties that we manage, just make up a number here, right? A thousand, for every thousand properties that we manage, uh, a, a, a week at 300 bucks a week is $300,000 of revenue that we're not getting per year. Let's say that we're charging a fee. I'm just going to make up a fee. Let's just say it's, I don't know, 20 bucks a week, right? There's 20 bucks times the thousand. That's $20,000 per week, like in a year or two years, that we're missing. So if we have a property vacant for a week, it'll cost us 20 grand of revenue. If we've got a vacant for two weeks, it'll cost us 40K of revenue. If we've got a vacant for a month, there's 80,000 of revenue loss that we've got personally as a business because we haven't been able to optimize the portfolio. So I think you know, the things that we do in order to get the properties rented with the shortest days on market and, and all those things just to systemize and optimize your portfolio is crucial. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Is there any tips or anything for anyone that you think you could share or anything? You... I think that we're in a, as I say, we're in a, a market now that is having high expectations of properties. Um, yes, it's difficult to get into properties and when people are in them, they want to stay in them and they're looking at properties that are well presented, they're well maintained and they have a few extra benefits um, over other properties, e.g. Um, air conditioning or ceiling fans or built-in robes or things like that. So from my own personal investment um, background, my properties I keep to a certain level that I know that I want to attract a, a certain type of tenant. Um, you have a dwelling that is inferior, you're going to attract inferior tenants and it's going to cause you trouble. If you can afford to spend a small amount of money um, and again, we work with a lot of people who say, look, I've got 5K, how can I invest that into my property to get the best return on the, on the uh, rent? So we'll, we'll look at what they've got. If it's a, a cooktop or if it's an oven or if it's an AC or a ceiling fan or paint or carpet, we 
we want to maximize your return for as little input as possible. Um, and you will get people wanting to look after your properties. That's the bottom line. If we don't have that turnover period that Nathan's talking about, if one tenant moves out and it's pristine and we don't have to worry about doing any maintenance to it, of course, we're going to rent it out a lot sooner. You have a property that's got a lot of issues, the tenant moves out, we've got a lot of issues to repair because the standard of tenanted properties these days is getting higher and higher and the expectation of the tenant is getting higher and higher as to what they want. So if you've got the ability to do it while the tenant's in situ, uh, that's even better because when we come to a rent review, Yes, we've done A, B, C, D to enhance the value of your property. We can put the property rental up by that much more. I just um, got a text message from the team today. Yeah, and I get these text messages. I'm like, oh, fuck. My phone just keeps going. It sounds like a poker machine. Because we're doing shit coming through all the time. Um, and <coughs> I saw a text message saying that one of my properties, it's vacant. And... Um, the team, uh, like I saw it, and there was just a question about like the carpet was a bit, how are you going? And um, I put carpet in this property because I did a reno like maybe 13 years ago on the property, right? <laughs> I did a full reno and I turned a one bedroom into a two bedroom. I put the kitchen in the lounge room. I turned the kitchen room into a second bedroom in there. And um, I did well out of it. And... Um, yeah, the carpet was looking a bit threadbare. I'm like, this location where it is, is a migrant-based location and like cooking and the smells and all that sort of stuff. So I um, I thought, okay, well, what could I do if I get extra, what could I get extra rent? So I replaced the, floor, the, the, the carpet and the lino with, um, with tiles and I did floorboard tiles. And the tiles were 35 bucks a meter for me to get. And I sent my tiler out there to do it. And, he charged me, I don't know, I just threw him 5k because he was going away, but that wasn't for that job. He charged me like I know, 60 bucks a meter or something. I give him a bit extra sometimes. <coughs> and I got like 50, 50 square meters in the unit. And he goes, Ah, oh, boss, you know, I've got extra tiles, you know, got it in my truck. I'm like, Keep it for the next job. And um, so maybe like 45 square meters. Um, let's say it cost me a hundred bucks a square meter, including the tile and material and labor. It's like four and a half grand, something like that. And that's being really conservative. It could be like full green. And in my text message, um, I had two applications, right? I had an open home today, two applications, uh, which people are going to apply for it. And uh, I'll put the rent up an extra $70 per week because I did that. So for me, I'm looking at everyone's out there going, I can get the best yield out of investing in the crypto or whatever, in the Bitcoin or something like that. I was going to think, okay, I would be happy to take a credit card at 20% interest. I'm not suggesting anyone to go get a credit card and this is financial advice. I'm just shit talking <laughs> here, right? If I had five grand, I could put on a credit card and pay off a credit card and save 20% interest. Or I could spend that same five grand on doing the reno and getting myself 70 bucks a week. 70 bucks a week is 3,500 a year, thereabouts. 3,500 over five grand, that's 70% return on investment per annum. Mm. Uh, and that's not mm. talking about any growth that I've had to the asset as well. So I think it's important as an investor, you're, a, you're an investor. Everyone gets too caught up in the fact of property. I'm investing in all different shit on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I went out to a farm the other day and I pulled out chunks of um, chunks of quartz. And I've got it getting crushed up at the moment to check the, the gold samples inside it. I've got 1,250 acres and I'm, I know there's gold there, right? And I'm literally going to dig the gold mine, right? Myself, right? I'm not even talking about it, right? I invested in shit. And um, I think as an investor, like I'm making decisions going, okay, where could I park five grand and get three and a half grand a year? It's like in mm. that reno, I can get a return from and it's an yeah. asset. I don't have to go and buy a new property or anything like that. If I do that across 50 properties, we all chuck in, I don't know, 250K, but I'll get 200 grand a year extra income. And it's like half the time I don't have to do the renos, but if I can see an opportunity to push that a little bit extra, I'm like, cool, let's, let's invest in that. So, And what we try and achieve after we've done a renovation like that is to push a tax depreciation report. Yeah. Not many people do it. They're like, it's 400 bucks. You'll get someone to come in and tell you what you can depreciate absolutely everything in your unit. Scrap value. Throw it all in the bin. Yeah. It was all lost due to, 
you know. It's all lost due to theft. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> There's claim it all plus the new one, right? So yeah. it's like a double, a double whammy and a double benefit there. So, mm. yeah. Thank you, Chris. Any other parting notes, anyone? No, I think we've kept them yeah. Yeah, long enough tonight. Appreciate you letting us into your home for a Tuesday night chat. Um, I've seen a few questions come through, but I, I don't even know what time it is. I think we've got, oh yeah, we have. We've gone on for nearly two hours. So, uh, an hour and a half. Yeah, and a half. So, thanks, Chris. That's Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all our investors and all the hard work that you and the team do to make sure we get a, yeah, the highest rents and all that. So, appreciate that. And, um, yeah, we'll catch up soon. If you need help, you know where to find us. Uh, if you have a investment, an investment property and we don't manage it for you, I would like to manage the property for you. And, um, Reach out to the team. Uh, you can contact Chris at bdmnsw at blinkproperty.com.au. Uh, you can reach out via our socials. Uh, if your property is located in any other state, just reach out to us, put you in the right uh, contact with the right people, and see what we can do to maximize your rent return. Lydia, I want to go and look at your portfolio as well. I just want to review your properties because. Um, uh, what's that? I've got a, one very, I, I think your portfolio, we can get extra bit of cash flow as well, and I know that I don't manage your property. So do we manage Tamworth? Yes, we've got properties in Tamworth. We do. Yeah. So uh, reach out to us, see what we can do, and uh, get some extra cash flow. That's why my number plate. Have you ever noticed I've got different cars? Like you probably never know what cars I rock up in. I was driving a blink car for like a year, waiting for new cars to run. My number plate is cash flow. You know, it's cash flow. So, yeah, it's all about that. So thanks a lot for tuning in, guys. We'll catch up soon. Keep being awesome and bye for now. Thanks.